I'm Vanessa Tyler. Welcome to Sartor TV. Next to the CEO is the COO. What does it take to make the number two job a success? Here to talk about it is the author of Riding Shotgun, Nate Bennett. Professor Bennett, thank you for being here, first of all. Please talk about your success journey. How'd you get here from where you started? <laughs> I, I have to say that the, the cynic in me gets a little nervous about labeling what's happened so far as a, a success journey. That's a pretty positive way to frame it. Um, I've been very fortunate in my life to be presented with a number of really great educational opportunities. And I was with it enough to at least make good advantage of them, maybe not full advantage, but good advantage. And when I was in graduate school, I, uh, I somehow caught the attention of a couple of really tremendous professors who invested in me. Uh, and help me understand uh, maybe that a, an academic life was the right place for me to be. Uh, it was certainly a very attractive uh, opportunity to be able to spend time studying things that were of interest to me, uh, working largely autonomously without too much of a boss, uh, and it's been a tremendous ride. You had that, but then you also mixed a little bit of consulting in business too. Well, I think if you're a business school professor and you don't have some opportunities to connect with the phenomenon you're trying to study, uh, you pretty quickly become illegitimate. Uh, and then two, the reason that I'm interested in uh, business is because I'm interested in business. And so I want to be in front of organizations having opportunities to work with executives, trying to better understand real business problems. Those are all things that, are, that help me get up in the morning. Can you share some key experiences with working with top management? Um, what are some of the common gaps you find in optimal functioning in companies? Generally when there's an issue in an organization, it can be uh, thought about as some sort of a misalignment. So organizations, just like a, a vehicle, have a lot of moving parts. And if those moving parts aren't working in sync, you can pretty quickly reveal uh, problems. Right, so just as a car has four wheels, if those wheels aren't aligned, the ride is pretty bumpy. You can still get to your destination, but it's not gonna be a pleasant ride, and you're gonna burn through a lot of tires. Organizations have parts that if they're not aligned, will similarly lead to a bad ride. You might still get there, but it's not gonna be a pleasant journey. So most of my work with organizations is around trying to help people understand what's the source of misalignment, and how do we correct for that. What are your thoughts on implementing organizational change? Any tips for doing it faster and more successfully? Well, that's a great question. The doing it faster part actually scares me a little bit because I think that it's often the case that what we really need to do is find ways to be patient enough and to do it slower. Um, we've known that organizational change is tough for a very, very, very long time. And there's an awful lot that's been written about the steps that are necessary to do change correctly, preparing your case, preparing the followers, moving into execution. So we, we know the steps, but there are things that we continue to do wrong, just as a few examples. We know that individuals resist change. They resist change because, frankly, the status quo is working for them. I mean, the reason someone stays in a job is because they've figured out how to do that job. And if you threaten that knowledge, it's natural for them to be a little bit resistant. And I'm struck by a study that I read about in Fast Company Magazine years ago now, where they followed a sample of um, patients with heart disease and asked them to move around more and eat less. That, that if they could lose weight, they'd lengthen their life. And if they couldn't do those things, they were at risk of dying. 90% of the people in that study chose to die rather than to eat less and move around more. Okay. If an individual isn't motivated to change when that's what the future looks like, why are they gonna care about a software implementation or a change in a process in an organization? Right? So resistance is, is really real and I think often underestimated. We say, oh yeah, they're gonna resist, but we don't really understand why and how deeply. Another uh, issue organizations often have with change is that they don't understand just how much change traffic is going on. Right? In most organizations, if you sit down with an employee and say, how many different changes are you trying to participate in now? 
it's not uncommon to get a number six, eight, ten. How can someone manage all that change? Managers are rewarded for finding things to change and for coming up with interesting business cases as to why a change should be good. But we forget to require them to kind of land the change, right? So changes get launched, they don't get landed. And after a period of time, there's an awful lot going on in that environment. People just can't keep up. And then finally, I think leaders overestimate how good their organizations are at change. Many companies just really aren't very good at it. And if you're not good at something, you want to make sure that you aren't trying to sort of begin with something that's overly complicated. The metaphor of uh, Olympic divers is really a useful one for understanding this. An Olympic diver score is a function of points that are based on the degree of difficulty of the dive and then how well they execute the dive. Leaders are really intrigued with big, complicated dives, but they can't land them. They get a bad score. If they tried a simpler dive and nailed it, they'd actually have a stronger positive impact on their organization. But they just can't get around the fact that they're not prepared to do a really complicated dive. You're an, an entrepreneur yourself. Please share your insights on the role of an entrepreneur and factors for success there. I've been fortunate in that my entrepreneurial exploits have really been hobbies. Uh, my mortgage has never been at risk. I've, I've never had to max out my credit cards. Uh, you know, I've not had to do many of those things that a true entrepreneur has to do. Uh, so I can't really say that I've felt the pain the way they would have felt the pain. But I can tell you that, that uh, persistence is absolutely critical for an entrepreneur. You're going to be told no a lot. You're going to fail a lot and very few people are going to be there to cheerlead for you. So you've got to be able to do that on, on your own. Uh, obviously, to be that persistent, you have to have a lot of passion around what it is that you're working on. If that passion's not there, you're going to be wasting the, the journey. I think those are the two things, and that's rather self-evident, I think, but, but really two things that are critical for entrepreneurs to be able to, to have. Now, let's talk about your book, Riding Shotgun. Why did you write this book? Um, any specific reason? Yeah, actually there is. Um, a few years back, I was serving as an associate dean in a business school. Mm -hmm. The associate dean is essentially the COO sort of job. The dean is very externally focused and very uh, strategically focused, and the associate dean is expected to make sure the place runs. I was working now under my third different dean, and it was remarkable to me how different the job was. I mean. Technically, I had the same job, I had the same job description, but coming to work was not the same. And so being an academic, the first thing I do is I look for something to read that might help me understand the, the situation I'm in, and I didn't find anything. And so again, being an academic, maybe I was a little frustrated because I wasn't going to get an easy answer, but it was an opportunity. And so I partnered with a guy, Steve Miles, who I'd done some writing with previously, and we set out to try to investigate what is it that makes this role so unique. Who is the primary target audience of this book? The primary audience for the book really obviously are COOs and people who aspire to be COOs. Similarly, CEOs really need to read the book. It's hard to properly leverage your COO if you as CEO haven't invested in understanding the role. I think it's an important read for boards if their organizations have or are thinking about uh, having a COO. I think it's an important read for coaches who coach executives. So that's the, the primary audience. That said, a lot of the findings are around the fact that the CEO-COO relationship is really an important one and one that can create a lot of value. And almost anyone who's in a number two position anywhere in an organizational hierarchy can benefit from some of the lessons about how do you form a really good relationship with your boss. So I think a secondary audience really is anyone who wants to have a better relationship with their boss. You have argued that the COO could possibly be the toughest job in a company. Why? Well, the COO's role is really where strategy turns into action. And it requires that there be, back to the point about alignment that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. it requires that there be an alignment between resources, operations, and people. 
And if those things aren't aligned, executing the strategy is going to be a very difficult thing to do. The COO is the one who's ultimately responsible for that, taking the strategy and finding a way to help the company live it. Mm, so working with what they have because they necessarily can't make those other decisions, but they have to work with what they have and make it still work and align it. That's right. They've got to, they've got to get this accomplished through everyone else. What is the overall scope of a COO's responsibility? Um, is it dynamic? The COO's role is very dynamic. It can, it, it's varied company to company. It can vary within company over time because what a company needs at one particular moment may not be what it needs further down the line. An entrepreneurial firm that's growing faster, that's trying to learn how to scale, has very different operational challenges than a more mature company that's trying to figure out how to be always more efficient so that it can be more profitable. Mm -hmm. So the role is extremely dynamic, and, and I think that's one of the things that makes it so fascinating. Similarly, what the CEO needs is different from situation to situation to situation. At the end of the day, the COO is there to support the CEO and make him or her effective. And what's required to do that is going to be different. That's not what we generally see in other C-suite jobs. A CFO job, chief marketing officer job, those tend to be more similar company to company to company. It is the number two job, as we know. Uh, does the COO take the blame, but not always the credit? That's an interesting question. I've had COOs say to me, and I think a little bit in jest and maybe a little bit seriously, that when a plant closes, they're the ones that get to deliver the message. When a plant opens, it's the CEO who's there. You know, I, th I think that's, uh, as I said, um, a little bit in jest, a little bit of, a little bit of truth. Uh, the reality is that if you want a lot of attention and a lot of credit for your work, the COO role is not the role for you. Uh, you have to be able to look yourself in the mirror, know you're doing a good job, know you're making a difference, because if there's attention to be paid, it's going to be paid to the CEO. That's a tough job. So even all the work you do, you may not get the credit. Right. It can't be about getting the credit. And again, it's, it's sort of where do you get credit? I mean, clearly as a COO, when you're excellent, you develop a reputation for being excellent at that role. And that can certainly help position you, for example, to be a CEO one day. But it isn't going to be your name thrown around in the paper. It isn't going to be your name in, in, in lights, let's put it that way. How does one recruit a CEO, COO? Hey, you have the job, you won't get the credit, but come on in. You know, how does one recruit? Please elaborate on the right process to getting a COO. Where I'd begin is by pointing out that there really are two sorts of motivations for being a COO. One group of folks really um, aspires to be a COO. What excites them is the opportunity to run something. They really don't want the name and lights. They really don't need to be the ultimate authority. What gets them excited is, is running something and running something well. That's a different person than the second type, which is an individual who sees the COO role as instrumental. It's where they're going to go to prove that they have what it takes to become a CEO. Right? So recruiting those two kinds of individuals looks a little bit different. The latter is going to be very interested in timeline. How long is the CEO going to be staying around? What does this opportunity really look like? So that's different than the first type. It is typically the case that a COO is going to come with a deep industry experience. If the COO doesn't already know everyone in the organization, they quickly need to learn who everyone in the organization is. There can't be any dark corners that the COO is not familiar with. Mm -hmm. So external hires are more challenging. Outside of the industry hires are more challenging. Those are some factors to keep in mind when, no, when looking a, for a COO. That's a good question. Would the COO come from within the ranks of, a, of an organization typically? Or Oh yeah, it's not <laughs> uncommon at all for it to be a, a promotion from within. Again, because if you think about what that person has to be able to do, they have to really quickly be able to get people to act and that's a whole lot easier to do if you understand how pulling different levers creates different results. If people know you, if people trust you, if you have a reputation for being a fair dealer, mm -hmm. right? And if you come from outside, those are all winnable, but it takes time. Does attracting a COO mean that you offer them next, that they're up next? 
I don't think it's essential that you do that, again, because as I mentioned, many aren't really interested in that position next. I think what's critical is that there be clear communication, because the last thing you want to have happen is for the COO to become impatient. When that happens, they're either going to begin to become tempted to say and do things that might actually be undercutting the CEO a little bit. In fact, we've had COOs tell us that that's when they knew it was time to leave when they got to the point where the CEO would make a decision and their first reaction was not, okay, how do I make this happen? Their first reaction instead was, hmm, that's not really what I would do. Once the COO starts thinking that way, that relationship needs to end. So essentially what happens is if you get the COO ready too soon, you're gonna lose them. They're gonna wanna go someplace else. So it's essential that you be really fair and upfront with people around timing and expectations. So if you bring somebody in and they think it's three years and now you're in year five, that's not going to end well for everybody involved. How can current COOs develop and implement strategies for growing into a full-fledged CEO's role? So the thing that I think is most important for a sitting COO to do in order to, to get ready to be CEO isn't so much around developing a specific skill. I think it, what it's really about is developing a great relationship with the board. And a CEO who is really interested in positioning a COO to be the successor, that's one of the things the CEO needs to do. They need to think about how can I give my COO opportunities to build really good relationships with the board, to demonstrate to the board that he, that he or she is capable and will be a great successor, right? Tim Cook at Apple was so prepared by Steve Jobs. It was a very deliberate effort to continually expose Cook to the board and to help the board get comfortable with the idea of him taking over. For, so for COOs, I think that's the key thing. How can you find ways to create great opportunities to present to the board, to have conversations with board members, to develop relationships with board members? Wow, that says a lot about the CEO, that, that CEO is not threatened uh, by a COO, because I can see how that dynamic could go awfully wrong. Well, it certainly could, and it brings us back to your earlier question about, uh, you know, sort of the, the time frames involved and, and the possible impatience that a COO might begin to demonstrate. Um, but honestly, if as CEO you're that threatened, it's probably not your only problem. There are probably many other things that are getting in the way of you being successful. Compared to other C-suite roles, which remain the same everywhere, you said this, does the role of the COO vary from company to company? Um, you talked about that. It depends on the company and what they need and where they are. Right. When we um, were writing the book, we determined that there were seven different kinds of COOs, and it's a little bit tedious to run through the seven, but just as a couple of examples. Um, there are instances where the COO is really brought in to mentor a young, less experienced founder. Back at the time we were writing the book, we talked about Mort Topfer and Michael Dell at Dell Computing. More recently, people have talked about the, uh, some of the, the folks brought in at Google to help try to provide the founders with some, some help. So that mentor is really important to a, uh, an entrepreneur, right? That's a very different kind of COO role than if you're brought in to be a change agent like Bob Herbold was at Microsoft years ago. And that job is, is different even still from a situation where the, the CEO just has some missing pieces. There's something about their personality, their style, their habits that leave them a little incomplete and by bringing on a COO, you have the ability to kind of round out that skill set and together they lead the company, right? And even that is different than what it's like to be a COO if you are, in fact, being tested as the potential heir. It's interesting. I was thinking about uh, a lot of new companies, uh, tech companies, where you have these brilliant young leaders who may not have that, like you said, deep bench experience. Mm -hmm. And so the CEO would kind of come in to bring structure while the CEO is out, you know, still creating um, some tech idea, something like that. Well, it's, it's very interesting in a, in a startup because the CEO yeah. uh, oftentimes initially is really about the technology, the idea. That doesn't necessarily 
make you a good CEO or a good COO. So there's a lot of learning that has to take place for that individual to grow with the company and, and to keep their rate of growth from slowing down the company's rate of growth. Typically, the CEO role is where they go. They're the founder, they're the, the name and face, they're who people expect to see. That's who an investor wants to see. That's who uh, pundits want to see. Mm -hmm. But you're right, to do that while at the same time trying to handle all the complexity of a rapidly growing firm without a COO sounds like a misery. What core skills are most valuable for a COO to develop? Does it change due to specific industry? Over the past 10 years or so, I would say that a few things have changed that really have required COOs to think differently about how they prepare themselves. Uh, the first really is around the recession that we've all, uh, we've all survived. For many years there was an emphasis on for the COO as to how are you going to continue to find ways to take cost out of operations. That period of time thankfully has ended. Now the challenge is how do you find growth and how do you do it in a much slimmer organization. So that's a different sort of skill that COOs need to be able to understand. And technology. Well, technology was where I was going to go next. And you think okay. about um, two things really there. One is, is more pure technology and it's mobile computing and what has mobile computing done to operations. One of the interviews that we have in the book is with Gil West, who's the COO at Delta Airlines. I can't imagine a company that's done more to use mobile computing to change the way they operate. And anyone who flies regularly knows that it's a very different experience now than it was five years ago because of what you can do with a smartphone. Similarly, big data is really changing the way companies operate. And COOs have to be conversant at understanding how you manipulate and then get insight from big data. So that's sort of a third thing. And then the fourth, really, has to do with the fact that just like all companies are technology companies now, all companies are global now. And that's become a really much more complicated dynamic. And COOs have to be much more of a global citizen now than they had to be 10 years ago. 10 years ago, they could be, relatively speaking, heads down into the operation. But heads down into the operation now means you have to understand what's happening in the Far East. You have to understand natural disasters and how they can affect supply chain. You have to understand threats of terrorism and what that might do to operations. Right? And these are things that were not quite so front and center for COOs just not that long ago. How can companies develop a robust pipeline of well-rounded talent for succession to an existing COO position? I think the key in trying to develop multiple candidates who might be able to develop into a, a strong COO candidate really lies in finding opportunities to move people around. Again, this concept of no dark corners I think is really illustrative there. To be an effective COO, you, you, you have to kind of understand where everything is and how everything works. And the best way to do that is through some sort of a rotational program that exposes you to different people and to different parts of the organization so that you really do have an appreciation for, for a lot of the nuance that, that cuts across. What are the fundamental capabilities that every aspiring COO should be able to demonstrate in their portfolio of skills and experiences? And what are some of the ways to develop them? Please share an example. I think it's critical for COOs to be able to speak knowledgeably about most anything that could be a challenge inside an organization. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for COOs to be able to maintain a certain calm. I think it's important for COOs to be able to be uh, humble and to own mistakes and to be able to pick themselves off, dust themselves off and move on again. I think that the COO has to make it absolutely clear that the most important thing to them is the organization and the people that work for that organization and the other stakeholders of that organization, whether they're shareholders or customers. So the selflessness, I think, demonstrated in the way someone carries themselves day to day is absolutely 
critical. And these are, are just personal disciplines. It isn't about a course you take. It's about the person you try to be every day. Talk a little bit more about the dynamics between the CEO and the COO. The CEO and COO relationship is really a fascinating one. Um, no two individuals need to be able to trust each other more than the two of them because they have to be operating at a place where each is perfectly comfortable with the fact that if the other was in the room, they'd agree, right? And by saying they'd agree, it, it doesn't mean that they've always agreed. It means they've done the work to get to a place where they can agree. CEOs and COOs fight a lot, but they do it behind closed doors. And when they get to the place that's the decision that is the, in the best interests of the company, no one should ever be able to tell that the two of them ever saw it any differently. Right? It's a really important thing that there just be an absolute seamlessness in that relationship. It's tricky. Is the COO always carrying out the vision or can the COO bring his or her own mark on a company? This depends a great deal, I think, on, on the kind of COO a company has, has wanted to put in place because there are certainly instances, back to Microsoft with Bob Herbold, where it was expected that he was going to sort of break a lot of stuff to then be in a position to build stuff the way it really needed to be. I mean, his, his task really was to sort of formalize and, and professionalize that organization, right? So he was given a lot of discretion as to how to do that. Um, there are other instances where it's a straight execution play. The board, the CEO, and certainly the COO has been a part of those conversations, but it's the board and the CEO that are setting direction and the COO's job is to make it so. The COO job uh, and scope of work change certainly over the years. Has uh, what we traditionally thought of as a COO responsibility changed in today's environment? And you talked about that already with the industry and technology mm -hmm. and what's going on now that the recession is, is over. The context in which the COO operates has become more complicated. That's, I think, the better way to think about it. The nature of the job is still what the nature of the job has been, which is to, to take that strategy and turn it into action. So that, that remains the job. But certainly the variables that a COO has to be familiar with are different, uh, more dynamic, uh, more complex than they've been in the past. You've consulted with many companies. Tell me about those companies and talk about the change you suggested to make those companies better. There are certainly uh, consultants who are interested in trying to help a company understand what it is they need to do to change. Maybe they have a, a book or a framework or a model that they feel is, is going to be the answer. That's not how I approach a consulting engagement. I, I approach a consulting engagement as an opportunity to help the people in that company understand what it is that needs to change. I'm never going to know their company as well as they do. I'm never going to know their industry as well as they do. So I feel like it would be a little bit presumptuous to come in and say, here's what you need to do. What I want to be able to do is ask the right questions and to be sort of a grease between the gears so that the gears can kind of work together to come up with a way to understand what it is that needs to change. So, for example, one company I'm working with now has for years operated in a very sort of high-touch uh, way. Uh, they provided the richest, best, most personalized service that they could, and they charged a lot for that. Their industry is changing, and there are price pressures, and they've got to find ways to operate that are much more efficient and they know that at some point this is going to cut into the amount of personalization they can do for their customers, but they want to try to minimize that as much as possible. They want to try to hide that they're becoming a low-cost provider, right? They want to look like an upscale store but operate like a Walmart. Well, I don't have the experience to tell them exactly how to make that happen, but what I can do is make sure that we have really thoughtful discussions about how do we approach this, where are we going to create misalignments, to my earlier point, and then how do we anticipate and plan for 
those so that they're not disruptive. In your experience, what do you see is a key leadership trait that's lacking in many companies today? I think one of the things that's, that's made leadership so uh, daunting today is the rise of social media. There are, there are no private moments anymore. You don't have to go very far back, just a couple of days. How many things that the United CEO, United Airlines CEO has said would he prefer now to have not said, right? There are just no private moments. There are no second chances. A mistake lives forever yeah. on the internet. And so the, the skill to me really is to be able to find a way to always be measured and always be careful and always be sensitive in all your communications. That's an excellent point because you're expected now because of social media to respond immediately. That's right. So you're being measured and you're responding immediately. There seems to be. That's right. Well, this is straying beyond what I would claim to, to have as an expertise, right? We're in the, the role of media consultants now, but your point is dead on right, and it is what makes the situation so uh, vexing, because you are expected to reply right away, and you also must be correct. You end the book targeting certain key considerations. What are they? I think the two most important things for an organization to consider if it's planning a, a COO role are first of all to make sure that it's the right time for the company. There are instances where there seems to be a tendency, particularly in the example of a startup, to want to give everyone a C title. We have four friends who have together created a, a new venture and somehow it would be demeaning if they didn't all have a C something title on their business card. Um, that's not a good reason to have a COO. It, it will confuse people and, and ultimately it will uh, end up creating conflict because at the end of the day they really aren't C-level folks. The second thing that's really important for the company to consider is, is the CEO ready for a COO? Is the CEO going to be willing to share power? Is the CEO going to be willing to invest in the COO to help them develop and to be effective? Is the CEO going to be able to be supportive of that individual? And if they're not, then the likelihood that they'll be able to, to really leverage that position for the benefit of the organization uh, is quite low. With the CEO, wouldn't it be a company that has a lot for that CEO to do? Because it seems like he's, he's taking his, his duties day to day. If it's a small company, there's not a lot going on, the CEO can do it, right? No? Potentially, yes. Yeah. We've had many people ask us, when do you need to have a COO? And, and I think what they're hoping for is that there's a revenue number or a number of employees or a number of markets that you're in or, or some other objective measure where someone can say, okay, time for COO. Such a number has escaped detection um, mm -hmm. by us. It's so situational. How much bandwidth does the CEO have? How much do they want to be involved in these sorts of things? How much are they willing to compromise on speed of growth? If they're willing to go a little more slowly, then maybe it's not so critical to have a, a COO. So there isn't a time that we can sort of forecast where it's right for the company to begin thinking about a COO. Professor Bennett, thank you so much for being here. Well, I've enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching Sardar TV, where creative thinkers come to share their ideas. I'm Vanessa Tyler. Join us next time.